Hello, everybody. Hello, and uh, welcome to our new masterclass. I think we are officially live, and uh, hopefully you can hear me. This should be a much better system than before, uh, because I'm now streaming from uh, an OBS, which is a program that everybody else knows, and everybody else has figured out like a thousand years ago, but I didn't. So. Uh, the good thing is that now I can pretty much see what's going on instead of just speaking to a camera with no idea how it works. So I see some of you guys are already here. Please do let me know today if you hear and see everything all right. I'm going to play some guitar and make sure. And uh, now you should hear it. Hello, Alex. All right. Hello, everyone. Yeah, so... Today's masterclass is about practicing scales and uh, using the time we spend practicing scale to make it more useful than I think 99% of people uh, do. You know, we, compar we compartmentalize a lot between, okay, we're going to practice scales and then I'm going to practice my ear training and then I'm going to practice my technique and then maybe I should learn a song. So today I'm going to try to help you make the most out of your practice, uh, your scale practice and uh, kind of you know, take care of a lot of things at the same time, all right? So, but before we do that, I just want to make sure that everything works. You know, I haven't been so nervous, I don't know, since when. This is way worse than going on stage because at least on stage there's somebody else. If, if anything happens, somebody can plug it in for you again. But uh, please do let me know everything is fine and we'll get started. Uh, what we're doing today in the masterclass will be you'll be able to apply it to any scale you want. Okay, so I'm gonna demonstrate it with a very simple scale. We'll, we'll see, you know, what happens, but probably just in, in major scale, maybe even C major. And uh, I'm gonna give you tips on different levels that you can practice, and then you'll be able to apply it to anything you want. You know, if, you, if you're studying very simple scales, then great. If you're studying very advanced things, you'll be able to apply all of this. Okay, so you shouldn't concern yourself too much about what I'm playing and uh, when I'm playing it, and, you know, where I'm playing it. I'm not going to go into it because it's going to be extremely simple and uh, is not the point of the masterclass. The point of the masterclass is just giving you tools to then you go out and uh, practice whatever it is you want to practice, uh, scale-wise at least. It, this can work on many things, but, you know, we're going to talk about scales today. And um, make the most out of it, okay? So don't worry too much about what I'm playing. Don't worry about, you know, oh, this is too easy for me. It's only easy if you apply it to the easy stuff I'm going to apply it to. Okay, uh, before we begin, uh, let me thank again all your support, you know, the donations have come in and uh, they're very much appreciated. As you know, these videos are not getting a lot of views. I think YouTube is trying to figure out what the hell happened to this channel after, you know, many years of intense activity and then it went dead and then it's back again. So I really appreciate it because this stuff is a lot of work. As you know, I'm not complaining, but uh, sometimes, it, it, you know, it, it, it might be a bit frustrating to see videos that don't get a lot of views, but your comments especially and your support but mainly the comments you know uh, everybody's telling me how useful these things are and so i'm gonna keep going and see how it goes all right so many more master classes to come and make sure you check out inside the song this tuesday because i think it's going to be very interesting and it has a little bit to do with scales too but it's going to be an interesting video all right so uh about the master classes very quick if you're new i see there's quite a few people here so welcome welcome if you're new to this uh master classes and we're live every Saturday at 6.30 Central European time. And I'm going to start calling out cities and countries from our friends here, the friends who join us and always comment and um, make these masterclasses the fun that they are. And so the live masterclasses are at 6.30 Central European time, 10.30 at night in Dhaka, Bangladesh, all right? And at 1.30 p.m. in Sao Paulo, Brazil, all right? And every week I'll, I'll shout out to a different country or a different city if you want to you know, represent your city and country, please let me know in the comments or in the chat and I'll make my, I'll do my best to, to do that. All right. So we'll be a bit more inclusive. Okay. And New York and LA, I still love you guys and uh, we'll do it again. All right. So, um, about the masterclass. So as always, you are your own best teacher. You know what I mean? So everything I tell you, you'll know pretty much where you fall. Okay. Where you fall on these different levels. There's five and a half levels today. And you'll know where you fall in these five levels, and you will know, without me telling you, 
you'll know what you need to work on. And maybe on the major scales, which are easier, maybe you are on level five, but then when you get into strange scales and the symmetrical scales and weird stuff like that, then you are at level uh, one you know, and you have to go back. Okay, so again, as always, do your own thing, use these as, as an inspiration. And of course, you know, I, I make sure to only give you good information, but still you should interpret it and, and figure out exactly what it is that you need. Okay, so uh, let me just show you, show off my OBS skills. This is what the webcam that I'm using ended up as just uh, two minutes after I opened the box. You see this little red tape there, because as soon as I plugged it in, the camera was auto focusing all over the place. And I thought, you know, you guys are going to throw up. This is going to be worse than me dropping the camera every five minutes in the old videos. And so I opened it up two minutes out of the box, opened it up, broke it. And uh, you, you, that little red tape there is me breaking the autofocus thing. And so now it doesn't autofocus, but I think I'm in focus. Let me know if I'm not. And so we should be good for all the master classes. All right. So um, that was just to show off my my OBS skills. You know, I really wanted to show you that I, I know how to hit a button. And uh, why do we study scales? Because a lot of people are thinking, well, I don't study scales. I just play by ear. Well, scales are kind of the basic uh, alphabet and vocabulary of music playing. So if you improvise, if you compose music, if you, if you maybe you just like jamming with people, you know, scales are the starting point. Now, can you do without scales? Of course, well, you can do without anything, you know, but if you're here today, it means probably that, or today or in the future when you're watching this in playback, um, it means that you're probably not 100% happy with where you are with your scales. So if you're here, it probably means that you need to learn your scale a bit better. But scales really are the, the vocabulary of what we want to do musically. And uh, it's true that you don't, you, you know, they're not going to make you better musicians per se. You know, it's like thinking that if I learn a word a day, I'll be like Shakespeare. You know, it, it won't make you. But Shakespeare did need to know a lot of words to write how he wrote. Some other people write great things with few words. But uh, again, if you're here, it means you are looking into scales and getting better at them. So um, the scales are, there are many scales. And every scale kind of give you a glimpse into a certain uh, emotional uh, level. There's a mosquito here, as always. Uh, there you go. It's gone. Um, the scales give you a glimpse into an emotional uh, thing you can say, into maybe expressing a certain feeling or a certain atmosphere. You know, it really depends. When you get good with scales, you'll recognize them. You know, you go see a movie and go, like, well, look at this. He's playing the Legion Dominant scale. Or he's playing the whole tone scale, right? If you watch the old Disney movies, when people are dreaming, there's always the whole tone scale everywhere. And uh, it doesn't mean you have to copy that, but it does mean that you have these textures and these feelings at your fingertips, and then you're able to, to, to play them. So we're going to assume that you're interested in uh, making your vocabulary a bit larger and also controlling the vocabulary a bit better. Right? We, we want to know new words, but we also want to know what they mean and how to use them. OK, so that's the main thing. And um, I'm going to give you, again, a demonstration of my great skill with a little, a little um, uh, what do you call that? I don't, I don't even know what it's called. Is it called an overlay? Anyway, it's uh, the fingers. This is step zero. We're going to take this step separate from the other five because without this step, it's going to be hard for you to work on the rest. So we're going to open a brief parenthesis here, and uh, I'm going to give you an exercise to really get the scales in your fingers. What happens when you play scales is that when you play scales, uh, you want to improvise with a scale. Let's say you're in C major. And unless you know, your fingers know where they're going, you're going to have a hard time accessing the, 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 the deeper levels of this, right? If you want to improvise and you want to maybe put the scale in your ear, it's really hard to do if you can't trust your fingers to do what they're supposed to. If you want to, you know, uh, impress everybody with your speed, it's really hard to do if you don't really know exactly where that finger is supposed to go. Is it supposed to be the fret 9? Is it supposed to be fret 10? And so that creates this um, inconsistency. And more, more important than that, it's, uh, it's lack of confidence. And lack of confidence is at the root of many, many issues with music. You know, people not really taking the time to really understand what it is they're doing. And then they go out into the real world and they have to play and it gets really hard for them or to record in a studio, even at home, you know, they start repeating the same thing a hundred times thinking that that's how they're going to fix it. And I've seen it many, many times. So 
how do we study this? Well, let's assume, as we, we're going to do for the whole thing today, that we're going to study uh, the major scale. You're a beginner, and you're studying the major scale, and you're starting by playing this scale, which is the very basic scale starting from C. OK, this is what you're playing. And uh, you really need to make sure that you know how to move the fingers in the right order, on the right string, on the right fret. OK? So if you start already improvising with this, it can be good. It's a separate thing. But if you really want to study your scales, you have to do it properly. So here's how I, what, how I would do it. Of course, this you can apply to any scale, in any position, in any fingering, whatever you want. OK? But let's assume we're going to do this. So we're going to do chromatically across the fretboard. That's the easiest thing to do, and it's the best thing to abstract and transcend the musical aspect of this. You're going to be focusing only on the physical aspect, OK? So you're going to be playing in the lowest possible fret. And I would say that includes the open strings. But if you're not comfortable with that, that's cool. Do it on the first fret, you know, the lowest note. Let it fall on the first fret. And you should play like this. Then you go up one fret. And then one more. Right? You work your way up all the way, maybe to the 12th fret. That's what the people used to say. You know what? I think you should go up to the last possible fret that you can play. And if it's not the last one, then tomorrow you try again. And you should be able to cover the whole fretboard. OK, so you play your, your scale all the way up and all the way down. Now, what does this do? By the way, can you hear the guitar? I hope you are. You should be, you should be hearing it in stereo and in glorious sound, although I'm not hearing it, because if I, if, I, if I raise the volume of the guitar, it will feedback with the microphone. So I have to figure that out without wearing headphones. But anyway, so if you're playing this, you'll be playing maybe, you know, let's say you have 24 frets or 20 frets. It doesn't matter. You play 20 times up, 20 times down. Right? And that means you've practiced about 40 times going up and down the scale. And then you can do it again tomorrow or tonight. You know, and so in a few days, you'll have practiced hundreds of times the same fingering. What that means is that whenever we move on to the next steps, you're not going to be wondering, eh, I wonder if it was it the third finger or was it the second finger? What string was I on? You know, you're not going to worry about that. And this is purely mechanical. There's nothing else to it. It's just mechanical. And uh, once you have that down, then we'll worry about other things. OK, first of all is that you have to trust your fingers. And you also have to trust your, your pick or, you know, whatever you used to play if you play with your fingers. So be mindful of everything when you play. I played it a bit fast, but you shouldn't if you're not ready for it. You should play. Wait, now. <laughs> You should practice with a metronome. You should practice your, your, your picking hand. If, you, if you're doing alternate picking, down, up, down, up, no exceptions. You know, uh, your, your hands should be placed properly. If you have a guitar teacher, great. If not, you know, whatever you're doing, we won't get into that today. But you know, try to do the best you can, because that's what you're trying to ingrain into your fingers. That's why you're playing it 100 times. Okay? And so this works great. And it's really not stressful at all, because you'll be doing something that's really uh, physical. You know, you have to apply your mind to it, but you don't have to stress too much about anything else. Just play up and down the neck and play properly. OK, so this is the, the we, we need to prepare for the other steps with this. If you're not ready, you know, of course, follow along the master class. But I'm sure there's a scale out there that you're not ready to move past this level. We all have a certain scale we don't know too well. So this is how you, you gain confidence. And when you have confidence, the rest is going to be a lot easier. If you don't do it, the rest is going to be a lot more frustrating. OK? And maybe you'll, you'll lose steam and you'll stop doing it. OK? So wait, I have some notes here, because there's quite a bit of stuff we're going to do today. OK, so uh, we're done with this, step zero, the fingers, all right? And uh, this is just for coordination and for confidence. And it will be great for you to do it. And now I'm going to hit this button, I think, and we'll move on to level one proper. OK, so step one is the theory. And of course, these are all uh, they're arbitrary levels that I set up. So they bleed into each other. You know, they you don't have to look at them separately. You can you can be in between them. But oh, hello everybody, Indrajit. Hello, that is Art. How is it up in Canada? It's good to see you guys. All right. 
Everything sounds good? Great. Metal Jazz, all right. Welcome. Everybody else, if you're out there just listening, please feel free to join in. We're, we're all friendly people. They are, you know, not me, but I'm supposed to be the bad guy because I'm the teacher. All right, so step one is the theory. The theory is the next level. Okay, so we practice chromatically to get stuff into our fingers. And now we're going to practice uh, knowing what we're doing within a certain uh, key or within a certain um, harmonic um, environment. Okay, so that's important. So moving the fingers is very important. And, um, but now you've done level zero, so your fingers are moving by themselves. So we're going to apply our mind and our ear to a different level. And that is being conscious of a key. Now, the key depends on what you're studying. If you're studying minor, if you're studying whatever it is, we're going to do major, C major today, or at least major scales. And so I know that I'm playing. I know that I'm playing a major scale, and I'm playing it in this position. So I should start knowing now what notes I'm playing. Okay, so for the major scale, of course, the circle of fifths, which won't be the topic of today's masterclass, but I suggest you, you go have a look if you haven't done so yet. And the circle of fifth tells you that C major has no sharps and no flats. So instead of just playing it like this, I think about it, I say, well, okay, it's C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. No sharps, no flats. Okay, so that gives me a context, a musical context that I can use later. All right? So how do we practice this? We don't want to go chromatically again because that's purely mechanical. And so we're going to use the, the circle of fifths to study scales knowing uh, what we're doing notes-wise and also what we're, what we're doing in the neck. Okay, so we're going to use the, the, the scale practice to understand the theory of the scale, but also the theory or the architecture of the neck. So what would I do if I play in C? The next thing I'm going to do is go down one step on the circle of fifths, which is F. I'm, I'm going that way, right? I'm going for the circle of fourths. If you're not familiar with it, just, you know, take, I have a picture in front of you of the circle of fifths and uh, you'll know what I mean. So F is the next one. I'm going to go to F and play the F major scale. It's the same fingering, but I'm going to play it in F. And not only that, but I'm also going to think about what I'm playing. And so I will say F, A, B flat, C, D, E, F. That's my major scale. And play. The next step is B flat. And it's the same thing. I go to B flat. If I don't know where B flat is, now this position is extremely easy because it starts with the root on the sixth string, and we all know the sixth string. But if I don't know it, then that's one thing I have to practice. And it will get easier because I'm going to do this every day, maybe a few times a day, until it becomes second nature. That's level one, right? So B flat, and I would say the scale. B flat, C, D, E flat, F, G, A, B flat. And play like this. <laughs> Right? And I've already played all this stuff. I played it when I was doing it chromatically, but now I'm applying musicality to it, or at least the theory behind it. Then I go to E flat, say the notes. Don't play like this, play proper. And then you go to A flat, say the notes, it's four flats. And then play, uh, where we're in a flat, we'll play D flat. Then we play G flat, B, E, A. Uh, D, G, and that's it, and we finish the circle of fifths. So again, we played this position, we played it in 12 different keys, that means we covered pretty much the whole neck, the first half, and uh, we've memorized or we've at least reviewed what notes are within each key, because otherwise it's going to be very hard to use these scales if you don't know what notes are playing, okay, because we're trying to reach a different level here. Um, the circle of fifth thing can be applied to a lot of things, and I want to do a master class just on how to use the circle of fifths for pretty much everything. And it's a great tool. Now, the difference between playing with circle of fifths and playing with uh, chromatically is that chromatically, even if you pay attention, like even if you go like, okay, F sharp, G, A flat, you know, even if you do that, eventually it, it just becomes so mechanical and it's so much easier. And so, the circle of fifths really makes you wonder where it is that you're going, and some fingerings that you don't have 100% worked out become a lot harder when you start moving them around. And uh, before we move on to the next step, 
imagine if instead of playing a position that has the root on the sixth string, that's when I'm starting to play. Imagine if I have a position that's maybe with the root further away. Like for example, if we're in the cage system, just because we had a master class not so long ago on it, if I were in the fifth position, I don't find a C until this note here, right? So if I want to move it around, I need C, and then I have to go to F. I need to know where my F is on the fourth string. Right? And then I have to know where my B flat is, and then with E flat, and so on. And it's it's very, it's a lot more, um, you know, you have to apply your mind to it a lot more, and it's a lot more useful. And just as an extra, for those of you who are too advanced for this stuff, I would say practice also the same thing backwards. Not on the circle of fifths, it doesn't matter, you can, you can run the circle of fifths in any direction. But I mean backwards with the scale. Because, for example, this scale here is a lot easier when I play from the lowest string to the highest and back than if I start on the highest string because my reference points, which are the roots, change completely. Right? So if I want to play um, F in this position, I have to know that I must start here and I, I have to understand that this is an F and this is just with this position. Some other positions don't, don't get the root until you reach the second or the third string. Okay, so it will really help you control all the, all the strings. So not only do it from bottom to top and back, but also do it from top to bottom and back. By top, I mean note-wise, right? Higher notes. Okay, it's extremely important and very useful. So this is a little extra thing for those of you who, are, who have reached that stage. Okay, so that's uh, level one. And I think it's pretty easy, and I think it's pretty clear. And so let me read some questions, or, or at least some comments. Canada is cold. Thanks, though. <laughs> is it cold now, in July? Wow. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. I'm, I'm doing great. Bertitrek, hello. It's good to see you. And Indrajit, best way to learn scales. Yeah. Well, it's only step one. Let's, let's go on to step two. Okay, step two. And again, please, please let me enjoy my, my incredible editing skills. Uh, the phrasing. Now, we've, known, we've learned how to play the scales properly. We learned the order and what finger goes where, level zero. Level one was, okay, now I want to know what key I'm in. I want to know what notes make up the scale. I want to know the sound and so on. Great. We got that. Now, nobody really plays scales like this. Right? If, you play, if you're playing a solo or a melody, I don't think you go very far in your band if all your solos were just scales going like down and up. And uh, so phrasing is very important. And of course, phrasing is free. Phrasing comes from years of listening to music, from improvising, but it can also be kind of uh, given a little nudge by practicing not uh, something you want to play when you improvise, but phrases that are very common and subdivisions that are extremely common. And so I'm going to give you a few examples. The first one that I would think of is uh, grouping the scales in shorter uh, notes, sequences. So they're called sometimes sequences, sometimes they're called, you know, whatever you want to call them, groups. But here's one, right? So here's a group of four. This is one way you can play the scale. So we take a, a major scale, which in this case here is C, D, E. You see, the only problem is I don't know if you're hearing me because I'm, I'm playing without volume on the guitar. I know you guys can hear it, but I can't. So sometimes if you if you don't hear the guitar, uh, let me know. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, right? This is my major scale. I'm going to break it up into small groups of four notes. C, D, E, F, D, E, F, G, E, F, G, A, F, G, A, B, and so on. So it sounds like this. And then you go on and you can work your way back. and you work your way down. Now, what this does is uh, it approximates, of course, it's not the whole deal, but it approximates uh, a very common way of phrasing, of, of building melodies, of building um, musical statements, uh, motifs, right? So a lot of times you, you have heard this. You see how many times you hear that four note phrase and uh, of course, you can play freely, but if you want to really get it under your fingers, then this is a great way to do it. Play the whole scale by using groups of four. The other great thing, and the reason I said that a lot of these levels are uh, not 
uh, that, you know, they're not uh, sealed the levels that you can, you can be in between them and you can use one to improve some certain things. So if uh, technically this is, this can be challenging. <laughs> Like the pick, you see how you have to move the pick if you want to, if I'm practicing alternate picking, that's something I might do. I, w I might play scales alternating and using sequences of four, right? Because then I can improve my knowledge of the, of the, of the fretboard, of, of, the, of the scale and how it sounds bro broken up, and also I can improve my picking. If I look for other possible phrasings, here's a group of three. Same thing, but I'm using now C, D, E, and then the next three notes, D, E, F, and then E, F, G. Right? And so this is one more way of playing it, and you see my, my, my picking hand now has to do a whole different job. It's completely different. I'm using... Every new group of three requires a downwards and then upwards is totally different from groups of four and again it's one way of playing that is extremely useful and then again will you apply this to everything of course not but you will have that you have that agility I don't know what came out but uh, you have that agility to do that if you want to whenever you're improvising okay because you are what you play and if you play If you play like this all the time, you, the risk is that you start improvising like that and playing like that, and we don't want that, okay? So let me give you a few other tips about um, how you can play this. I would suggest that you at least practice the first seven possible groups, okay? So I would say groups of two, groups of three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, I will demonstrate just a couple of them. You don't, you don't need me to do that. But um, groups of two, it literally, is you take two notes at a time. So it will be C, D, D, E, E, F, and without the stops. Uh, yeah. Now, this is strange for a lot of people. They're not used to playing like that. So the, pick, the picking hand gets all screwed up, and it's a great practice. And listen to that interval of seconds. And then you play groups of three, groups of four. I suggest you move on to the strange ones also, five, six, and seven. So five will be like this. Now your ear probably says, wow, that's weird, and your fingers don't want to play it. And that's exactly the reason you want to play it, because then you'll be able to create stranger uh, articulations when you play, stranger melodies, and still control them. All right, so five is really useful. I use it a lot. Uh, six is basically uh, uh, two triplets, but still you can practice it. One, two, three, four, five, six, right? You move up six notes at a time. Uh, and then you can do seven. Seven is great because it's the whole scale. And uh, it's also pretty hard on the fingers. So you do that, down, up, down, up, for the, every position in every key, and you'll have few doubts about scales then. All right, so um, there are other, pos uh, other possibilities. You can, you can come up with your own sequences. You can skip a note, so play C, E, F, G, and then D, F, G, A. I'm making this up right now. There you go. Okay, so you can play that. You can make up all kinds of weird stuff. And uh, everything is useful. Everything you cannot play today is great practice. Okay, so I would suggest you do that. And also you focus on both hands and don't let it slip. Don't let mistakes slip. Don't let bad notes slip. Don't let bad sound. Don't let your tempo and your timing go off. Terrible thing to let happen. So if you're having problems, slow it down. Practice it more and stay there because uh, it doesn't really matter how much you practice if you don't practice properly. All right, we're gonna move on now to step three. If, I, if I'm going too fast, please let me know and do write stuff in the chat if you want. And uh, even, even if I don't get to it right away, I will of course keep it in mind. So let me know if you guys are all good. And uh, if I'm going too fast, too slow, too easy, too difficult, you know, uh, let me know. Don't be afraid of joining. And if you're watching and you're silent, 
please join the conversation. These are all nice people and a lot of them great guitar players. So, you know, it's a nice group of people here. All right. So, yeah, some of the combinations feel odd on the fingers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, some of them do, you know, and on the ear, which is great. And talking about the ear, that's level three. Level three is the ear, or we could call it ear training, or we could call it, um, you know, whatever you want. But basically, every scale has a sound, as we said before. And so far, I talked a lot about that and the sound, and you have to know what you're doing and hear it. But really, we only move fingers. And uh, knowing scales without internalizing the sounds and knowing what the scales do to you emotionally, you can't really predict what they're going to do on other people. But since we're all pretty similar, you can, you know, if something really touches you and affects you musically, you can pretty much be sure that it will have a certain effect or, or similar to people. And that's why you use certain scales for certain songs and for certain themes. Right? But how do you know that if you, if you don't know what the scale sounds like? So if I'm playing some chords for you, even if I tell you what key they're in, how do you know what scale to play if, for example, two or three scales are available for that progression? Because I can have a progression that's only made up of one chord. And check out next Tuesday's uh, Inside the Song for that. On Tuesday, there's a video on, on right, just that, like playing a whole verse, like a long, long sequence or over only one chord and still managing to to create musical movement. And so how do you pick, right? If you don't know the sound of a scale, how do you know you want to use it? That's the basic question. If you don't have an answer for that, uh, you know my videos are not necessarily like, oh yeah, you're great all the time. You, it is what it is. We all have problems with the guitar. We all have problems with the instrument. And you have to be able to recognize them. And as soon as you recognize them, you, that's what you attack, OK? And so if you have any scale that you really are not quite sure what it sounds like, and the test for that, you, you can't sing it. If you can't sing a scale, you probably need to work on it, OK? And so playing without knowing what the scale sounds like is kind of like buying a bunch of colors and throwing them on the canvas and hope that something will resemble a Picasso, for example. Picasso did not paint like that, and Da Vinci didn't. And can you make some great paintings just by throwing paints at the, at the canvas? Of course. But then you wouldn't be here looking for somebody to teach you what color goes where if you want to paint like Picasso, right? And so if you're, if you're in studying scales, you should t take it upon yourself to really figure out what the scales sound like. So um, internalizing the sound of a scale is probably the most important thing you can ever do as a musician. And here, there's many ways to do it. Let me just give you a few steps. So the first one is to sing the scale. It's that simple. And there are many levels to this, but we're going to look at the easiest one today, which is basically to sing along to the scale. I don't know if I can, because I can't hear it, but it would be like this. C, D, e, F, G, A, B, C, and then you can keep going. If you don't, if you can get so high with your voice, just sing an octave lower. D, D, C, D. Right? I'm singing one octave lower in my range, no problem. So I go D, C, B, A, G, F, E, C, D, C. And I can't hear what I'm playing. I'm sorry. D, A, G, F, E, D, C. Right? That's what I'm playing and that's what I'm singing. And I'm doing it for every scale over the whole circle of fifths because that's what we're practicing. So if I'm practicing this position of a major scale, I'm going to sing it and I'm going to sing it through the whole circle of fifths. And this is the first step. Okay, This is the first step and it's incredibly important. But again, uh, we don't play like this. So we're going to break up the scale and uh, into every single interval. And that will also make us uh, more aware of the difference between scales because we're not going to see the scale or hear the scale as one blob of sound like, like blah that's a scale right da -da 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 -da, major no no no. we're going to hear all the notes separately and when we hear all the notes separately we we'll go like okay well this group of intervals sounds like a major scale and that group of intervals sounds like a phrygian scale and that one sounds like a melodic minor that's what we want so how do we do it we take the scale and against Did I hurt your ears? Sorry. Uh, against the, the root of the scale, we're going to sing the different intervals. So we're going to have seconds. C, D, E, 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 F, F, G, G, A. And so we're going to sing the whole scale by seconds. Then we're going to sing it and play it by thirds. Right? But, so singing it. C, D, E, E. E, F, E, G, F, A. Um, 
D, B, A, C. It's really hard not hearing the guitar. I'm very sorry about that. I'll figure it out for next time. And if I have to wear headphones, I will. But you see what I mean? Then you can sing fourth. And then fifth. And then sixth. And then seventh. So you see, even just playing this is pretty hard. It's not easy work. You know, and then you have to work your way back. Second. Third. You see all these rolls? And then this fourth. You can see I spend a lot of time doing this because it's extremely useful. And this will take months sometimes to do this on every scale. And so maybe today you go like, okay, I'm going to practice thirds. And you're going to play and sing over all your positions that you're starting in all the circle of fifths by playing and singing thirds, right? If it sounds like a lot, it is a lot. This is what my channel is about, sorry. Uh, there's no three tips here. <laughs> Three tips to become a great guitar player, uh, maybe three years or three months. But you know, the good thing is that you see results really quickly. And that, that is true. That is true. You see results like maybe in a day or two, you're like, wow, I feel like I'm connecting with the guitar. And that's because you are not separating the guitar from the fingers and from the ear. All right. So <clears throat> this, is for the, this is it for the ear training. As you see, these are very deep concepts. And we could actually spend a whole masterclass on each of them. But I wanted to give you something for each level. So step number four is the technique. And uh, it sounds a bit weird because really everything you've done uh, so far can be used for technique, right? Because playing the sequences that I said. Right? This is groups of five. It's pretty hard. It's pretty hard to play. Oh, did you hear it? Did you ask for a fourth? I thought it, subconsciously, I think I saw it. That was fourth or thirds. Right? This is not easy. So you're practicing everything at the same time. And that's why you're saving time, even if you're applying a lot of it. And um, there are many things you can do, uh, but I'm going to give you three, three little things. One of them is to play arpeggios. I know we're practicing scales, but really, eventually, you see how chords, arpeggios, scales, it's all the same thing. But the, what I'm saying is within, within every scale you practice, you should be able, of course, because you're playing the notes of the scale, uh, you should be able to find every arpeggio that fits that scale. So in the case of C major, if I'm playing C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, there must be a C major arpeggio, C, E, G. There must be a D minor arpeggio, D, F, A. There must be an E minor arpeggio, E, G, B, and so on. There have to be all these arpeggios in there. So I can pick them out and play them. Uh, sorry. This is the first eight. So I'm playing all these arpeggios and uh, I'm breaking up the, st the scale that I've been practicing linearly pretty much the whole time. And now I'm breaking it up and I'm playing it completely differently. And also, if you want to sing this, again, all these levels mix up and, and you can go from one to the other. You could sing all these arpeggios and think about the benefit of that, knowing how every single chord in every key will sound like. Right? So I can play um, an arpeggios in C major. I got a bit slower, right? So you can see it. And then you continue, of course. And you work your way down. But then you have to do it in F, right? Because we're following the circle of fifths. And then we do it in B flat major. Now, how about you, you say the name of each chord you're playing, right? You see, it's endless. It's endless. You can go as deep as you want with this. Uh, the other thing you could do is uh, for technique is uh, just a little bit of advice if you want to get into it this weekend, uh, is play short sections very fast. OK, I'm not going to do it because I can't hear what I'm playing. But for example, you take two strings or maybe, uh, yeah, maybe some uh, like that, right? Or you could play three strings. Or you can apply sequences or here, maybe even where we were. 
and apply them fast to whatever it is you're practicing and play them faster. And uh, you won't be able to do this for every key because it will take forever, but just isolate a little section and play it properly. You can do down up, backwards, up and down. You can do it on one string. This is harder than it looks, right? You can do all kinds of stuff within the scale. You see, then, then you're, you're really trying to squeeze everything you can out of it. Uh, one more thing that I would do is uh, probably change the picking pattern, right? So if you're used to playing your scale starting downward, and the thing is, <laughs> you've been practicing, if you've done all these steps, you've practiced every scale like a hundred times or more. So to break out of that, you can then start, I'm going to try starting with an upstroke. You know, up, down, up. And it's, it's strange how difficult that is if you're, if you're just playing, used to playing downstrokes. Or you could do all downstrokes, extremely useful. Or all upstrokes. This I, I leave to students all the time. I have some students on Skype, they go crazy with it. <laughs> because playing all upstrokes is extremely useful. It will make your alternate picking a lot better. All right, so this is just a few ideas. But uh, the technique aspect of it is, um, is very easy to do because in the meantime you're practicing all these other stuff, okay? And finally, and this is easy, right? Make music because why are you studying all the scales if then you don't play music? So you don't need to do all the four levels before it. You, you probably shouldn't, you know, the music should be level sub-zero. But uh, you know, this is about improving so we had to go through all that. But really uh, playing music is the most important thing and what I would do if I were starting out with any scale, is first of all I would play. The first thing I would play, I, would, I don't care if I don't know what I'm doing, I don't care if I don't know what key I'm in, I don't care if I don't know the notes. I just figure out the pattern for a scale and play and listen to it. And uh, I, don't, I don't even listen to the notes, I just listen to the feel for the scale. If it's something that motivates me, because if I have to spend hours and hours on it, I have to be motivated. Uh, does it make me feel anything? Where am I, if I'm cataloging later in my, in my in my boxes or in my files, emotional files, what, what file would it get into? You know, is it going over here with the happy stuff? Is it going over there with the, with the um, ethereal things? Is it going mysterious? You know, where is it? And then I will say, okay, well now I'm going to start moving through the different levels. First of all, put it under my fingers. Second of all, this, uh, you know, improve the knowledge of what notes are in this scale and where can I play them. Then getting into my ear, then improve the technique on it because maybe I want to improvise it. And if it has some strange, if it has a strange finger like this, then I need to be able, you know, I, I need to develop technique for it because I'm, Otherwise, I'm just too much, too used to older patterns, you know, so my technique needs to be updated. So if I get that down, uh, between each level, I will always go back to making music, right? So if I, I, now I have it under my fingers, I make some music with it. Uh, now I have it uh, in my ear a bit better, I still make music with it. You know, I never stop making music with things. Um, the song Lights and Shadows, I hate talking about my stuff, but you know, that's what it is. Uh, Lights and Shadows, came up, I, I studied that scale and within seven or eight minutes I had the whole, basically the whole song, or at least the part of the song that uses that, that very exotic sounding scale. That was just five, you know, five minutes literally. And then I had to go back to it and go like, okay, what am I doing? You know, what chords can I build with it? But the first uh, impression is very important. So always make music. There's nothing else, really, there's nothing else to it. But uh, to improve your making music skills, I would say there's a few things we can do. Uh, first of all, set some limitations, especially if you're in the early stages. So I would say maybe pick, uh, you know, this might sound ridiculous, but it's extremely useful. Pick three or four or five notes only, maybe the first five, and try to work with those. Sometimes the, the, the money note is on in the first three or four or five notes, right? So if you're playing Phrygian, the note that makes it Phrygian is right there. Sometimes it's not there, and so you go like, why am I studying this scale? You know, I, I'm not hearing anything. And then your ear is, is moving forward, you know, beyond your fingers, and that's always what you want. And so when you go like, okay, now I think I got the five or four or five notes, let me play the whole scale one octave, 
you know, then you'll hit the money note and go like, wow, now I know what I'm, now I know why I'm doing this. For example, if I'm playing uh, mixolydian, I don't get to the, to the modal note until the very end. So I might be wondering, why am I doing this on five strings? It sounds the same as major. But that's when your ears start yearning for something new, and then you give it to it, and your ear now knows what it sounds like before you play. And that's key, that's extremely important. All right, so that's one thing. Um, let's see, I had some notes here that I, I haven't been reading. Uh, okay, yeah, so one thing is always, uh, not always, but play with chord progressions. Okay, that's, that's one thing that's very important. Play over chord progressions, make sure they're the right chord progressions for whatever scale you're playing. I've seen it a lot of times. Man, this Lydian scale sounds like crap, you know, because you're playing over a C major progression. You can't play C Lydian on it depending on what chords are in there. So make sure the chords agree with the scale. All right, very important. And uh, the other thing is play without any anything underneath. You know, try to squeeze the sound and the emotion of the scale yourself out of the scale instead of relying on the chords. And I, you see me do it a lot of times in the master class, it's just... Uh, it's really hard to do without hearing myself, but if I were playing a scale like... Uh, uh, let's do Lydian, we were talking about, or, or Mixolydian, let's do Lydian. I'm going to try to... You know, play the Lydian note, then hit the wrong, not the wrong note, but the major note, and try to compare them. You know, that's what I would do without anything underneath, and see if I can establish the mode myself, without the help of chords. Okay, I would do the same with, with Mixolydian. <laughs> a few times and as soon as I can use these notes you know to make sure that you hear the mode without the help of chords and then compare it to the major scale that's what I would do without un anything underneath and finally the best thing you can do if you want to improve your playing and your musicality is to go out and play with people Play with people, go to bars, go to jam sessions, invite friends over. And if you can find people, or your teacher if you have one, find people who are better than you and play with them. Go to a music store. You know how many years I had a phobia of going to music stores? Because people started to know that I was playing. When I was 16 already, I was playing in pretty big places in Milan. And I would go to a store and go, hey, you're the guy from the band. And play something. And I, would, I was terrified. I was terrified. I, I didn't know what I was doing without the comfort of the songs I knew. And uh, I figured that that was a bad thing, you know, and so it's really important. Put yourself out there. Um, if it sounds like crap, well, so what? You're learning, right? We all sound like crap many times. I still do a lot of times. And, uh, but go out there and put yourself on the spot. That's the most important thing because that's where you'll find out exactly what it is you need to work on. Okay, and, and uh, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like sounding like shit <laughs> to motivate you, okay? And never let anything bring you down you know we're all we're all in the same boat more or less no matter how good or bad you think you are uh, we're all doing the same mistakes you know we're all we're all trying to improve the same things uh, we're all trying to write better songs it's all the same you know we're all in the same boat really i'm not saying it to make you feel better but this is pretty much it for today um i think again as always you might have to go back and watch it hopefully technically this was better than before not not better than last week because last week was pre-recorded but better than the last master classes you can see me properly and i i'll have a look later and uh, see the playback now as always feel free to ask questions and uh, if you have any comments on this master class please let me know uh, while i wait for your questions or for your comments please and i want to i don't want to be a pain in the ass but if uh, you know if you're new here Please do subscribe, maybe, if, you know, if, if, you, if you want to, it would be very much appreciated. Like, comments, you know, watch the videos, uh, maybe spread the word if you're into, you know, if you, with your friends or I don't know, whatever it is that might help these videos reach more people um, because I, you know, from the feedback we've been getting, I think a lot of people are, are, um, are benefiting from this. And, uh, you know, since we are here, then we might as well be here for more people. All right. And... Uh, <clears throat> That is art says, uh, okay, yeah, he wanted to hear the fourths, so we got that covered. Sounds great, thanks. And uh, a man missed the live stream. No, hello, Stevo. Was that you? Did you miss the? Did you miss the live stream? It's okay. It's gonna be up there for for a long time. 
a lot of things to work over. Yes, I am benefiting from this. That's great. That's great to hear that is art. And Indrajit, what would you consider a respectable speed to practice scales? Well, it doesn't really, there's not one speed, of course, as you might guess. Um, you, you know, it can get very fast, of course, but I would suggest that a, a, a good speed to begin with is uh, maybe, depending on your level, anything from one note per beat, about 80 or 90, all the way up to 120, then you work your way again to 60, and you do two notes per beat. So two notes per beat can get you up to 120, 130, 140, 150, and still be kind of realistic, because a lot of rhythms you'll play, half, um, you'll play eight notes. And then as, I would say as soon as you can, but without you know, losing sight of playing properly, but move on to four notes per strings or three notes per strings. Uh, I mean, I mean, sorry, per, per, per beat, right? So 16 notes or triplets and play them. I think anything above 120, four notes per, four notes per beat, which is about eight notes per second. That's pretty good, you know, and you can go, f you can go. I, I remember doing this with a student a long time ago in, in, when I was in California, we, we, we sat down one time and go like, okay, let's see how fast we can do this. And, you know, you get lost into this if it's, uh, you know, is it 15 and a half notes or 60? You know, it doesn't really matter. Nobody cares. That's a great thing about it. Um, as you know, I, I, I have some songs and uh, very few people have ever commented on fast, uh, on the speed. They might have commented on something that sounds fast or intricate, but never quite anybody has been moved <laughs> by the exact number of notes I play per beat, you know, and, and I, I see it in myself too. I, I never seem to focus on it. And actually when people do it, I, I lose interest really quick. Now, if it's something intricate, now it, it, it sounds difficult, but it sounds difficult musically. So it sounds interesting. I hope this uh, kind of eases your concerns about speed. It's really not that big of a deal, even though sometimes, you know, it's, it's great. Sometimes I've used it. Uh, uh, sometimes there are things that I play that I go like, wow, you know, and I have to play it again live and I have to sit down and practice. But overall, speed is really not that big of a deal. And it, you can be fooled by something that sounds fast, but really what it is is musically interesting and intricate. And uh, played at a, not slowly, but at a normal speed or maybe a bit fast, but it might sound a lot faster. Even just something as simple as where it falls on the beat, right? If it doesn't fall square on the beat, it might sound faster and more difficult. So there are many things to consider. I would just say play properly. And the other thing is you're, you don't have to play too slow either. You know, you play slow a few times and then if you can, then you should bring it up, okay? Bring it up to speed, but never go too fast. That's, that's the number one thing you can do to lose time and waste it. I've done it many times, so that's why I know. And I've seen people do it all the time. Uh, that is art. I'm benefiting from this, like these sessions for sure. All right. Well, it's good to hear. Thank you so much for all the info. Guillermo, Guillermo Caes. Where are you from, Guillermo? Only if you want to tell me. Well, great. Thank you for the comment. How important is it to practice scales with the metronome? Extremely important. You will need the metronome until you know you don't need it. And uh, the metronome is probably the most important thing past a certain point. Like in the beginning, everybody can just pick up the guitar and they get better because like everything else, like you, you never play tennis and you give your rack, uh, uh, you know, the thing and you go, okay, and you hit a ball once in a while. But very soon you, you reach that level and you really need to, pra to practice properly or you won't improve. And I've seen that in a lot of students, a lot of them. And you know the great, the crazy thing, not great, not great, but I, I have students from all over the world on, on, on the internet, you know, for, for one-on-ones and they all have the same problem. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what kind of music you play. It's all the same thing. They get to this level and then they kind of get stuck there. And the reason they get stuck is because they can't go past the level they used to. And so the metronome is like the great level. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. It doesn't matter how many people are in your band, uh, you know, follow your band or how many followers you have on YouTube. Eventually you'll, you'll have to put the metronome out and play a certain amount of notes in within a certain amount of time and if you can't do it you can't do it you know you can't fool yourself with the metronome that's the greatest thing and uh yeah so it's very important <clears throat> for practicing yeah you don't want to play like a metronome meg shetty hello can learning scale help me develop my ear yes and i suggest uh, i think you just got here and uh, welcome 
but I suggest you go back as soon as we're done, go back to level, um, what was it, level three of this, uh, in this video, and it's all about your training. Please follow my instructions with that and you should be good. And we'll do a lot more uh, master classes on ear training because it's extremely important. So today we kind of covered a lot of bases and they can be, you know, they can be further, furtherly uh, improved. You play speed run on your song City Lights, always blows me away. Yeah, Indraji, thanks. Yeah, there's a few, <laughs> that song has a few runs. You know, there's a song called uh, uh, Upside Up on the last record on Mystic Electric. And it's a very simple song. It's like, uh, I don't know, I don't know if I know how to play it, but it's like. It's really basic stuff, but then it has, after the solo, which is basic pentatonic, it's not too hard. And there's one, I think it's a, it's a harmonic minor scale, just going down, blah, and, and, uh, and it, was, it was so hard to do. You know, I, I, I just played it once when I recorded, and I said, okay, great. And then I was trying to figure out the song for one of the videos, and I said, okay, this is for later. You know, I, I can't play like this without practice. So yeah, sometimes I fall into that, but you know, I think speed is, it can be very good, right? It's like if you have a painting and you need a spot of pure white, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Or, or if you, you know, in a movie sometimes you do need the chase scene, right? Because that's interesting, but you, you kind of have to know how to use it. I enjoy having it if I need it, okay? I really, I really enjoy that, but some people don't need it, so you, they shouldn't worry about it. Guillermo, you're from Colombia, from Colombia, South America. Yeah, I think, I'm sorry, I think uh, I, you, I've seen you before, right? Well, welcome back. <clears throat> that is art. I've noticed that a lot of Eddie Van Halen and others doesn't always play fast. That's right. Just playing interesting riffs and that and choosing interesting sounds. Of course, yeah, we respond, we respond to speed only when it's a contrast, I think. Um... <clears throat> The, the speed itself by itself, I think it's been proven beyond reasonable doubt that they're not enough. You know, they, they, it's like, you know, the, the records when every record was extremely loud and as loud as possible with every section as loud as possible. And people thought it was great for five minutes and then, uh, and then everybody hated it, but you had to keep doing it. Not me, but you know, they had to keep doing it because otherwise they wouldn't be as, as loud as everybody else on the radio. But speed is the same thing. Speed has to be applied in a certain spot. You know, that's my opinion, of course. If you want to play a record that's blah, 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 all the time, maybe, maybe that's great too. I don't know. It, it just doesn't resonate with me. It just doesn't. But um, yeah, Van Halen certainly and Randy Rhodes and, and uh, you know, Hendrix or Jimmy Page, you know, my favorites. Uh, of course, the, even, even Satriani and Steve Vai and even Malmsteen, you know, everybody says it's like blah, 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 all the time. But especially the older stuff was very, with, with ta you know, it was tastefully done. There was quite a bit of thought behind it. And uh, so that's, I think, what people respond to. Just playing fast, I don't know, it gets, it gets old quick, at least for me. In Dragic, yeah, the notes falling off like liquid gold. Well, that's a nice, that is a very nice way of putting it. All right, so I'm sure there's a bit of a delay. I hope I'm not cutting anybody off. So, but we do have to close sometime. But please feel free to, here's one. I agree, I've heard many solos where the speed goes on too long. Mixing it up works better. Yeah, and if you play emotionally, you'll know when you need that burst. You know, and sometimes you don't need it at all through the whole song and you don't do it, or try not to. <laughs> so anyway, I was saying uh, there's a bit of a delay, I don't know how long, and uh, I hope I'm not cutting anybody off, and you're all welcome to use the comments later, you know, let me know all your questions, suggestions for new master classes, the last one on secondary dominant chords was a suggestion by Alex and it was a great suggestion at that and I don't know how long it will take for me to do a master class on your suggestion but I will keep it in mind 100% and again thank you very much for all your support and for being here and for watching and for spreading the word if you can if you gotten this far congratulations now turn YouTube off and go practice your guitar <clears throat> but before please do subscribe and like and uh, that's it well I hope you all have a great week ahead of you play a lot of guitar. On Tuesday, I'll see you with the Inside the Song video. I think those are great videos. I hate to say it myself, but they're not getting a lot of uh, attention right now, but I think they can be extremely useful for songwriting. So check them out. You know, it's our own little secret. And uh, thanks much, Andre, for answering questions and giving another lesson. Always waiting for the next one. All right, that's, that's great. That is art. Thanks a lot. And thank you guys for being here. You know, we wouldn't be here without you. And I will see you very soon with a new one.
have a good one and uh, be safe, all right? And now let's see if I can turn this thing off. See you soon. Bye-bye.